Uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a lovely lunch, and thanks to those uh, who are joining us again um, online. Um, so this is our third session of the day, uh, which is entitled The Role of uh, Civil Society and Other Organisations uh, in Supporting Reparations. And this was one of the major themes uh, of, the, of the project and one of the handbooks um, that's been uh, a result of the, the project's outputs. So I'm delighted to say we have a range of uh, speakers, both in person and online, um, today. Um, so we're just going to take uh, about 10 to 12 minutes each uh, in, in name order that you can see on your um, running order here. So our first uh, speaker is uh, Paul uh, Gallagher uh, of WAVE. Uh, Paul is a trauma education officer uh, and his PhD was entitled A New Social Movement Theory and the Reparations Movement in Northern Ireland, the case of the WAVE Injury Group and the, its campaign for recognition. And this was completed here in Queens in uh, 2021. Paul's a member of the Wave Injury Group that led calls for a pension for seriously injured victims of the troubles that resulted in the establishment of the Victims Payment Board. So, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, the evidence will, will tell us that not many reparations campaigns in the world are, are uh, fully successful. Um, the campaign for recognition by the Wave Injury Group is but one um, of a few that. Um, had a successful outcome. In the next few minutes, I want to take you through um, a very brief history of the campaign and, in particular, the role of civic society in bringing this forward. The injured group, in essence, became a new social movement, led by a group of direct victims, people who suffered injury during the most recent conflict. The campaign for recognition was given its nominal title back in 2009. This need for recognition stemmed from the decades of relative invisibility for those who had suffered with disability. These were the amputees, the paralyzed, the blind, the deaf, and those with psychological problems. During the conflict, these individuals, those who had narrowly escaped the fate of over 3,600 who filled the cemeteries, were in many ways left to get on with the surviving and recovering from their injuries on their own. The state, in the eyes of those who would later form the injured group, had forgotten about them. They were, in the eyes of one participant, left on the economic scrap heap. This man, paralyzed in a gun attack in 1979, was unable to return to his career as an insurance executive because to continue in this role, you needed to be the big six foot four guy in the three piece suit. He was also told that his previous role as a teacher um, was impossible, as the school would not be able to bring um, the classes down to the ground floor to accommodate him in his wheelchair. Others described the inequities of the criminal industry's compensation system, which operated throughout this period, and Kevin mentioned that earlier. Instead of considering the long-term needs in terms of disability, this system said to a young woman who was injured in a Drive by a student at the age of 17 that you wouldn't see past their 33rd birthday, she's now in her 60s. This same system would require uh, those seeking compensation to strip down to their underwear in a small room at the back of Belfast High Court, while barristers representing the financial interests of the state would examine their injuries with measuring tips. Such degrading practices led those victims to accept lesser offers just as a way to escape. These grievances stuck with those who were unable to return to the workplace. Many became dependent on welfare benefits, unable to save, unable to build a pension. Those who were injured throughout the 1970s, 80s and 90s, as they edged towards their later years, they faced poverty. The cruelest thing was that for so many years they were unable to do anything about this predicament. They were isolated, stuck at home, trying to put their own lives together, trying to keep their families together just about surviving. Now, this changed when they came along to WAVE. WAVE or WAVE Trauma Centre, which was formed in 1981, is but one of many um, victim survivors groups that were emerged at this time from the bottom up, from the grassroots of civic society. Like many of the groups, they were formed as a response to the lack of support from the state. Um, and they were born over a cup of tea in people's living rooms and people's kitchens. Um, and have grown, however, to be the main hope for many victim survivors um, today. 
The role of WAVE for this group of injured victims is critical to the success of the campaign. Um, those who were attracted to WAVE and who formed the injured group came forward for a variety of reasons. Some came for counselling, some for physiotherapy, some for welfare advice, some for social support in the men's group and the, and the women's group. But the crucial thing was that they were, they were there. They were now under the roof of WAVE. They had the opportunity to meet each other, to see each other, to recognise their common problems, to itemise their collective grievances, and this, this was critical. No longer were they the individual victims with their own worries and their own concerns. They were part of a wider collective with a new collective identity. They were the injured. Now, it would have been unthinkable for any one of these individuals to have started a campaign of this scale alone. They needed the structure, they needed the resources that we have could provide for them. A place to meet, for example. But this alone was not enough. In 2002, the first iteration of what would become the injured group was brought together when a letter was sent out to Waves Injured, asking them to convene a forum to discuss the issues they faced. It met only a few times over the following year, and in the words of one participant, due to low numbers and a lack of a dedicated way of employee, it died at death. In 2005, there was another attempt to reform the group, but again, the momentum fell away, and the group just started along with no real focus. This is often the fate of many social movements in these situations. The game changer, in the words of many participants, was the introduction to the group of a dedicated WAVE employee. Alan McBride was seconded to the group in 2008 after an approach for one of the members for help. His leadership, organisational and motivational skills, his enthusiasm um, really transformed the group at this stage. With time and added resources committed to the group, the collective started to build momentum and to focus on what it wanted to, to really achieve. Now they knew they had problems, now they had to figure out solutions. They had to frame their grievances in a way that made sense to those that could do something about it, the politicians and policy makers. This framing created a, a salient narrative to convey their plight, their stories, their trauma, the events that changed their lives in an instant had to be retold. For many, it was only their families and close friends who knew what had happened to them. But these were purely personal stories to create a campaign for recognition, they needed to make the personal public. That came in the form of the Injured Book. The first edition of the Injured Book, Injured on that day, was published back in 2009, the third edition earlier this year. This set out a series of events which befell these individuals at various junctures during the Troubles, and for some it was the first time they told their tale, a process that was both therapeutic and empowering. Now, the book itself wouldn't have been possible without the resources of WAVE um, and the, the efforts of McBride that, that, to compile this. They secured a public funding um, for a run of 2,000 hardcover books, which they were able to hand out to policy makers, to be able to let them know that the injured existed, to educate them. The launch took place in the Royal Victoria Hospital, a symbolic place, a hospital where many of them woke up after their injuries. Members of the press, following a press, press release from WAVE, came along. And following this, there was an invite onto a Sunday morning politics show. Now, this media opportunity presented an insight into the next target of the campaign, the general public. This would be achieved through a, a public petition, which saw the group onto the streets of Northern Ireland. Again, this required considerable WAVE resources and coordination. Printing petition seats, transporting those with wheelchairs across a series of towns and cities. Alongside the petition, which took nearly two years to collect 10,000 signatures, we have commissioned a major study which researched the needs of the severely physically injured and their families. Carried out by Professor Marie Breen Smith, this report was launched on the same day as the petition was handed over um, to politicians at Stormont, at Doyle, and the 10 Downing Street. This was in May 2012. Now this concerted, concerted effort was covered by a wide range of media outlets and would lay the foundations what would crystallize as the injured pension campaign. The idea of a special pension for the injured was 
but one of 21 recommendations in this report. Others included rehabilitative measures, such as support for disability aids, extra um, healthcare support, and enhanced welfare support as well. Some said, I've got this the wrong way around, can only Boris Johnson here. <laughs> the notion of a, a special pension, however, was one that the group believed was doable and would provide long-term tangible benefits to those who had been so dismally treated. A smaller lobby group was selected from the waiter injured group to lead the vanguard. They began to meet with local politicians of all stripes in 2012, and the initial response was favourable. The group was then asked to go back with more solid proposals. What would it look like? How many people would receive it? How would injury be assessed? What would it cost? By 2013, with the support of a wave welfare advisor, the lobby group was back up in Stormont with a report that laid the foundations of what would become the Troubles Permanent Disabled Payment Scheme. It was, this was a gap of eight years, and you may ask why the delay. Now, politics was the answer to this. Political disagreements and the insistence of some uh, to exclude others from receiving support from this particular scheme. Now, it would take another hour to go in through the intricacies of this, and I don't think we have time to do that here, so we'll, I'll leave that for another time. A lot of us know the, the issues, but in some ways, it was down to the issue of complex victimhood and the lack of recognition for complex victims. News stories such as disabled ex terrorists may receive £150 pensions were plastered um, on the front pages. Um, radio talk shows as well. Other politicians would get involved in talking about the issue of no provo pensions. Some said they would never accept the pension if a terrorist got it. Others said that if one of our guys didn't get it, then nobody would get it. It was total logjam. For the injured group, the policy was to keep on trying to find a way through. They had their own thoughts on the impasse, but in the end, it was going to be up to our political representatives to make the call. This avenue shut down in 2017 when storm had collapsed again. However, when one door opened, another, one door closed, another door opened. The group had already been looking elsewhere for support for the demands. In over October 2016, they had written an open letter to civic society to support them. This included writing to leaders of local churches, NGOs, um, and politicians across the water. This is because Westminster became the new target. In previous meetings with the British government, it considered the pension to be a devolved matter, but by 2017, this was a moot point. There was no devolved government. Westminster was in control, and the pension was now Westminster, no matter whether they liked it or not. This period coincided with the government's consultation and the Stormont House Agreement. The pension had clearly been included in the document, um, and after extensive lobbying, we found that it was not included in the consultation. This ignited a backlash from the group, and we created another social media campaign to mention the pension, and to make sure that anybody who was contributing to this um, did so. This included a response from the model bill team at Queen's and from Luke and his team here as well. They were great, and Luke was no stranger to the group. Luke had campaigned alongside us since 2014 as well and met with the politicians too. He also um, drafted a, a bill um, to, to hand the politicians. The injured group also made two trips to Westminster at this time. and We were given exclusive access to a range of MPs and Lords and Shadow Secretaries of State. And we began to create a groundswell of, of um, support within Westminster for this. A lot of this was down to, and I know that uh, Mark had mentioned this earlier, but Dennis Godfrey, who was a former director of communications of the NAO, his little black book got us into places that nobody else could, and this was, this was crucial as well. By the summer of 19, 2019, um, we managed to get an amendment introduced into a government bill, and the pension became law in July 2019. Now, while there were further delays when the scheme came back to the reconstituted Stormont and a subsequent judicial review, the scheme opened for applications on this day um, one year ago. While progress has been slow so far, people, some of the most grievously injured during the conflict, have begun to see this come into their bank accounts. In summary, I'm sorry for taking up all your time, while this scheme these reparations are now in place. They are not perfect. They do not capture everyone who, in my eyes, 
need this type of support. However, they would not exist if it had not been for the efforts of a small group of victims who had come together at a particular time under the roof of the Wave Trauma Centre. Without this NGO, there would have been no injured group, no injured book, no petition, no injured report from Marie Breen Smith, no lobby group, no pension report, no media push, no Westminster networks, no amendments, no act of law, no judicial review, no pension. All of these efforts came from the ground up, from the grassroots, but they were nurtured through a series of ever-expanding networks across civic society, the recruitment of charismatic and motivational leaders and influential politicians through the mid-level structures of WAVE, which helped these once isolated victims move up the pyramid to reach the elite politicians who could actually make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, our next speaker is online uh, and is uh, Julie Giraud. Uh, Julie is with uh, Reparations Consultants with Global Survivors Foundation and a long-time consultant for the ICTJ in Morocco and Peru and was a member of the technical group on reparations for the Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She's written extensively on collective reparations, uh, gender, sexual violence, and transitional justice in, in Peru. Are we good to go? That's not happening. So we'll scrap that. Uh, uh, so we'll turn to Andrew. Hi. Um, Andrew Murphy of the Relatives uh, for Justice uh, has worked there since it first opened uh, in 1999 and works voluntarily. Uh, first and is now the Deputy Director for Responsibility uh, for Operational and Budgetary Management and has been a key voice in the promotion of a focus on women in the debate on how to deal with our past uh, and the need to ensure that those who have experienced the worst of our conflict have the biggest say in how it is addressed in a human rights framework. So please, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hopefully Julie will come and talk to us another day and um, be so interested in, in her work. I want to begin by just acknowledging what Paul has outlined to us. You're an absolute hero and the entire group with Mark and all the others are absolute heroes and it's my absolute privilege to share a platform with you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, as has been explained, um, the Deputy Director of Relatives for Justice. Relatives for Justice is an NGO that works with many people who have been bereaved and injured as a result of the conflict, like other victims groups in the North. And we were founded in 91, um, during what has been termed by others as the end game of the conflict. So there were a lot of families who were affected by uh, violations by the state or where state collusion was alleged, who came together with human rights activists and lawyers to form a support group. Essentially, what they were doing at the time was saying us too. There was a focus by many people on uh, Republican actions and the victims of Republican actions and those who were being affected by these policies felt isolated and felt that they didn't have recourse in a criminal justice system that was built to protect um, state actors and we know that um, from, from many emerging themes since. So it was a campaigning group. They were campaigning on issues around policies of shoot to kill, collusion, the use of plastic bullets. They were also working with um, lawyers like uh, Peter Madden, whose legal partner, uh, Pat Finucane, had been killed, Seamus Tracy, who was a practicing barrister at the time, to develop legal strategies in terms of how could families who felt that they were completely excluded from the criminal justice system engage with the criminal justice system to, to find some sort of remedy and also to just challenge the official conflict narratives. So when their loved ones were killed, the first story, if your loved one was killed by the state, the first story out that would have hit media um, fax machines would have been from the MOD or from the RUC, or from something like that. The last one is going to be the family saying, no, hold on, there's something else I want to add to that or there's something I want to contradict in that. So families were, were together trying to contradict what had happened previously. You can imagine what, what that was like for families in areas that were overwhelmingly working class, overwhelmingly um, felt as socially and economically deprived. You know, where the skill sets there, where the resources there, it was very, very difficult. And I suppose 
what is often said also is that um, an, a narrative that challenges the state might be perceived as emboldening a different narrative. But that isn't what a family was trying to do. They were only trying to establish the facts around what, the killings of their loved ones. And then along comes the peacetime context quite quickly um, from the founding of Relatives for Justice in 94 and then to the peace agreement in 98. And we all know that there are new and emerging needs. So it goes beyond the factual conte contextual issues and to the emerging needs of now that violence is gone, what about me? What about my children? You know, and reflecting on the cost, the emotional and um, psychological cost, I suppose, and the family cost that families have paid and was very, very difficult. So what we also saw then in parallel with that was the reforms of the legal environment. So um, we have the criminal justice uh, review, which created significant and deep reaching reforms of the criminal justice system, which opened avenues of redress for families at the same time. So I suppose what happened was that we saw um, an increase in support services for victims and survivors and truth and justice becoming this site of contest, um, which it remains um, for families. So their needs um, in terms of maybe therapeutic support or support as families um, coming to terms with loss, grief, transgenerational trauma, um, were certain, certainly not a contested area. But when the same family was searching for truth and justice, accountability, acknowledgement for harms that had happened in the past, they found that that was the Cinderella of their rights. And always, they, were, they remained contested. They remained the difficult issues to raise in any room. And that's really difficult for families. I'd like to say something just very quickly about Article 2 um, of the European Convention. Article 2 has become almost like a shorthand for all of us now. And families will use it. They'll talk about um, the truth and justice processes, the Stormont House Agreement, uh, the Legacy Bill, and they'll talk about Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And that's really interesting because that becomes, a, a, that is absolutely jurisprudence from Europe that is a result of families taking the system that was loaded against them to court and finding re redress in Europe. And from then, the idea of Article 2 compliant investigations and processes emerges, completely as a result of uh, families' own um, advocacy, along with human rights lawyers. You know, and so this becomes the shorthand for them. But what does it mean? It means for them that they want international human rights norms to apply to them, their family, and to the truth and justice issues that surround them, the denial of truth, the denial of justice. They want human rights compliance that was the opposite of their experience. They didn't need a lawyer to tell them that what they experienced was the exact opposite of human rights compliance. But when you actually see it down in law, when you see it written down, that is really meaningful because it's a validation of your experience. I suppose what it means for them is that the criminal justice reforms were meaningful when the Attorney General started to reopen fresh inquests, when the PPS put the, um, recommends that um, an investigation into steak knife happens, when the PSNI um, talk about their Article 2 compliance. That means that their experience and their, and their um, activity in challenging impunity has worked. And that is really important for them. And I suppose what's really important as well is that new historical narratives start to, to emerge from inquests, from these fresh investigations. The, that first facts, that told lies, is being rewritten now. There are new historical narratives. And for them, for their children, for their grandchildren, that is everything. So for an NGO that works with these experiences, I suppose challenging state narratives and assumptions, you become the awkward voice. Right? You, if you're working for Relatives for Justice, you're used to being the person that people kind of go, what's she going to say <laughs> before you start? Right? And um, we, we also then, we search for the other voices that are often not in the room. So women's voices throughout the transitional justice debate have been absent. Um, it required significant um, activity for some of us to develop a 
you know, principles around how we ensure that a gender lens can be placed to any of our processes on dealing with the past, to any of our processes on supporting victims and survivors, because that has been entirely missing. We insert state violations, of course, because there's a narrative of both sides. Both sides often excludes the state. So when you go, here, hold on a second, here's the state, <laughs> you know, you have to be awkward, and that can be really, you know, difficult. Inserting non-discriminatory language. So we ensure that our language that we use does not exclude the, ra the range of violations that have been experienced by the citizens we share this space with. And I suppose when we do that, what relatives for justice, what those families are, is a constant reminder. It's a reminder of the nature, causes and extent of our conflict for some people who just aren't really that willing to be discomforted. And I suppose that shows the value and remains the value of families saying us too. Families being in a room, included in rooms, where they say it's our experience too, it's not instead of, it's not to exclude someone else's experience, it's to say us as well. And I suppose the core values of inclusivity and judgment uh, and non-judgment are really, really important to all of our work. It doesn't just apply to therapeutic work, it also applies to all of our work so that we ensure that we are inclusive and we don't have people outside the room. So I've hinted a little bit of what can be frustrating um, as NGOs who are working around reparations rights um, in this context. So I would say um, the principle of inclusion can be seen as anti-state. There can be an, an impression that by saying us too can mean that that challenges a state narrative and that can, that can be seen as taking a view on the conflict, which it isn't. It's just saying us too. Very, very high up people will so talk about those additional narratives and those additional us twos as being pernicious. They've been called pernicious. Now for a family who has experienced a violent loss and injury to be called pernicious for just trying to establish the truth and to achieve some form of accountability is extraordinary, but that's okay if, it, if it's about the state. I suppose 99% of the work that I've spoken about is not in the public frame. It's not seen out there. It's families working really hard to overcome the barriers that they experience in their lifetimes as a result of trauma and the intergenerational effects. That 1%, however, does get a focus um, and can be seen as contentious. And then that affects the validity of the 99% of the rest of the work that we do or those families do. And we have to think a little bit about that. And I suppose the work which challenges non-state actors' actions and, um, and supports those families gets sidelined. Because the same person who's challenging the state, if they're also uh, supporting people who are affected by non-state act actions, and somehow they don't, they, they're not seen. And we need to think about that too. And I have to say, after being doing this for a while, always being the voice of discomfort is wearying. And if it's wearying for me, imagine being the woman whose husband was killed in her home by, an, by a group where she feels that the state, or she has evidence that the state was involved in that shooting. Imagine how she feels having been through inquest after inquest, challenge after challenge, process after process for her. It, she's just about had enough, and that's the rest of our responsibility. All right. Thank you very much. I'll check with Luke, I guess, before we introduce our next speaker. You have Igor? <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, yep. Yep, good to go. Okay, uh, Igor uh, Shvetkovsky is an international uh, reparations and transitional justice specialist, currently providing expert advice to the Ukrainian government and victims uh, of the war in Ukraine. He was formerly a uh, global focal point on land, property, and reparations for uh, in the International Organization for Migration and senior advisor on reparations to the Global Survivors Fund. Uh, over the year, he's worked across a variety of programs and initiatives, uh, including the German Forced Labor Compensation, 
uh, Holocaust victims uh, assets programs and a huge range of national reparations uh, and restitutions uh, programs. Uh, so we look forward to hearing, Igor, what you have to say today. So, <clears throat> thank you very much. First, uh, Tech, can you hear me well? Good? Yep. yep. Okay, then I can continue. Well, thank you very much, uh, Luke and, and, and Princeton University Belfast for inviting me for, for this one. And I'm very happy, you know, that the, the, the project has come uh, to a suitable end with coming up with the, with the handbook. Uh, with, and which will probably, you know, initiate further ideas and further work, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I remember when this all started uh, years ago and me coming from an organization, international organization, a five years project was something which seems like a, uh, it's uh, going to take a long, long time, but here we are, we have the project, it is being done, uh, uh, and it's moving forward. And um, uh, I'm uh, amazed uh, and inspired by the speakers that we had so far. Uh, uh, and I know I'm here to speak about the role of civil society in implementing reparations. Uh, but before actually, you know, uh, talking about that, you know, let me just, you know, reiterate something which might be uh, um, uh, counter uh, uh, intuitive to the title of the session is that the state still has a primary responsibility for uh, uh, implementing respira uh, reparations. It is the state duty who should ensure, which is the reason, you know, uh, 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 why we are having this discussion, because as I think Luke pointed right at the beginning, very few countries from those one who should have implemented reparation pro programs, very few states less than 25% have actually done so. So that represents a challenge and that sort of, you know, explains why there is a need for the NGOs and what is the role of the NGOs. But having said that also, you know, we also need to keep in mind that the NGOs are not as homogeneous. You know, what we understand under the term of NGO is not a homogeneous term. It will differ from a context to context. It will differ from a situation to situation. And you can identify many different type of NGOs who act at different level and contribute toward the issue of reparations in a, in a different ways. So in the past 20 years working around the globe, you know, I had an opportunity to exchange views, to collaborate, uh, to work together, to consult, to learn from many, many NGOs around the world. Uh, and you can clearly defer, you know, make a difference, for example, between local and international NGOs, which is a basic distinction. But within that, you know, then we can also look at the, uh, 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 and see that there are many different NGOs who have a different approach and different functions and how they fit into the reparation process that will be determined by them. Uh, to, for, to start with, you have a grassroots NGOs which might pre-exist the conflict might, in some cases and might be community-based organizations. And, and in some contexts, there might be organizations which are being formed and established by the survivors and the victims themselves. So you have these type of NGOs which are closest to the victims, to, in victim, uh, to which victims probably have the biggest trust in, and so on and so on. Then you have the typical human rights NGOs that are in, you know, if you're speaking at the national level, uh, level <coughs> mostly located in the capitals, you know, who have, who are, you know, uh, uh, pretty much advanced in terms of their understanding of issues of human rights and transitional justice, and who are, you know, uh, uh, in a position not only to document which are doing, in many cases, the crimes that are happening and keep a record of them, but also advocate for them. And then you have another set of NGOs, which I have also met along the way, which are basically, you know, the service angels, the angels who are delivering some type of assistance, who are often specialized, you know, in psychosocial support, they're specialized in delivering, you know, basic humanitarian assistance and so on and so on. So you have many different angels. So it's not a one term that we can think of. And and, and in, in some cases, yes, there would be NGOs who would be sort of a combination of all of them. And these are probably the most successful ones uh, in terms of, you know, advancing the, uh, the issue of reparations. But in many cases, they would be sort of specialized in a certain way. In some cases, some NGOs would be concentrated around one category of victims or more of them. So that's also can be an advantage and it can be a challenge in some way. But all in all, there is a definitely a huge role for the NGOs, not huge role, but maybe even determining role for the NGOs in when it comes to um, comes to reparations. As I mentioned before, you know, many of the NGOs, be that grassroots NGOs or the NGOs, the human rights NGOs, they're the ones in many cases who are documenting the 
uh, war crimes or crimes, uh, crimes against humanity or other human rights violations that are happening in the country. And they can certainly contribute to the reparation process in, in many ways. First, primarily by advocacy, because they are the ones who can, can have a strong voice, who can actually uh, convince the state and the state actors, regardless of who they are and the policy makers, on, uh, 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 um, on the need uh, uh, and, and the obligation as well to implement reparations. Um, but then they can also offer support in terms of you know, with the documentation. Uh, in some cases, you know, that once the reparation program is being established by the state, there is an opportunity for the, uh, uh, for the state to uh, leverage the experience and the document, documentation and information that is available with the NGOs in order to do a verification, uh, in order to do corroboration of the witness statement and therefore, therefore sort of, you know, uh, 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 lessening the burden that would be put on the victim, you know. So, that's you know the role to advocate and the role to to sort of you know uh, 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 contribute with the documentation. That's one of, of the of the roles. The other role that the NGOs play and, and can play it's uh, uh, it's definitely in the in implementation. In many countries, the state does not have a capacity to implement certain type of programs. You will see many states where there would be a lack of, for example, of 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 uh, 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 medical centers, official healthcare institutions who can offer, so for example, social support. And in such, such cases, NGOs, you know, and uh, can definitely contribute to it. And uh, especially if they already have the expertise or they acquire the expertise, uh, they are not always capacitated, but the capacity can be built so they can certainly do it. So they can do the implementation by themselves. And, and in some cases for particular issues, uh, uh, for particular types of preparation, specifically, you know, psychosocial rehabilitation, where it's a direct contact between the victim uh, uh, and the one who is providing the support, perhaps the NGOs are in the, in the best position to do so because they are probably trusted more than the government officials, which might be there uh, in some cases. So, uh, and the final function, I think, you know, and I think probably that's also the most important function in it's to monitor the compliance of the state with the policy that has been put in place, if there is a policy which is being put in place, uh, and compliance with international standards. So the same NGOs who deal with human rights, you know, uh, uh, and who are familiar, who have contributed uh, to the creation of the reparation policy, they're the ones who should also have a role in terms of, you know, uh, making sure that the, the state is delivering the, the reparations in accordance with, with what is being decided. NGOs can also facilitate the consultation process basically you know being the conduit for the voice of the victims not every victim it's a quote unquote angry victim or active victim who will be able to speak uh and 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 deliver their uh, his or her expectation in terms of what reparation and justice and so and so so ngos can actually act on behalf of those silent victims that we don't usually hear from uh, so that's also an important role that the NGOs can play, can play in the creation of the reparation policy. However, there are also some challenges, you know, when it comes to engaging engagement of NGOs. One thing is that, you know, the engagement of NGOs on the issue of reparations should not be perceived as absolving state of the responsibility to deliver reparations. Uh, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there have been NGOs who have been dealing with victims of sexual violence since the days when, when the violence was occurring. And they continued to do so for 20, 30 years after the conflict, yeah, which basically, you know, you know, relieved the state from the, you know, moral and, and uh, no, if not legal responsibility to pursue, you know, a reparation mechanism uh, for the victims there. So in some cases, you know, there is a potential that the, the activities of the NGOs might be perceived as a reparation and therefore, uh, either um, uh, instrumentalized by the state and say by saying you know you have so many things going on under reparation you have this type of assistance you get that type of assistance therefore there is no need for reparation from us so there are other challenges as well and I think you know uh, 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 James Gallen earlier mentioned you know the the sort of the epistemological biases you know that you know uh, um, uh, people who work on transitional justice, you know, face in some cases, you know, or, pre or present in some cases, you know, you can have this epistemological bias in the, also with the NGOs, it depends on the profile of the NGOs. So if the NGO is primarily focused on criminal justice, 
it is very unlikely that they will be able to engage the victim or the state or interested to, to, engage, to, to engage the victim and the states uh, on the issue of reparations or vice versa. You know? So it depends also on what is the, the position, what is the epistemological background of the, of the, of the organization, what is their capacity, their interest and, 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 and funding as well. Um, lack of capacity, yes, that can be an issue in some cases, you know, particularly the most the NGOs, which are the closest to the victims, which can deliver most and which can facilitate this, particularly the discussion with the victims, they're not necessarily capacitated to do so. Uh, the transitional justice terminology is not something that is familiar uh, to them. There is a need for not only for translation, but sort of, you know, a uh, uh, more integrated approach, understanding also what justice means for them, etc., and sort of coming together on a common ground and capacitating them on base of that. Some NGOs can be also politically uh, motivated. So, I mean, we have seen over the world in many different situations, you know, that and you know that uh, NGOs can also have a political motivation. They would be interested only to advocate in a particular for a particular set of victims. Uh, not in terms of category of victim, but in terms of identity of victims, which is, you know, uh, uh, not the ideal situ situation. But the biggest problem, uh, and I think where the state comes back in into play, is the issue of sustainability. You know, most of the NGOs around the world they depend on funding, which is based on projects, which is based, uh, which is which are being funded by donors. And donors they come and go. They have an interest in certain countries when it comes to transitional justice, then they lose it and they go. So what is the point of, you know, starting a project or, you know, which will galvanize and raise the expectations of the victims on the issue of preparation if the project lasts only for one year and there is no plan for it moving forward? Hence, you know, the necessity, you know, to, for the NGOs to, to, to work with the, with the state, not in, in a way only to, 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 to confront the views and, and, and to change the policies, but also to make sure that there is a sustainability in terms of what the efforts that they have been putting so far, and that the victims are not left alone once the uh, once the project is being finished. So overall, you know, I try to give a picture from my experience of working with NGOs across the globe. There are probably many things that I could speak about in more detail. Happy to answer questions. Um, also, pity the time is short. Um, I think there were very interesting and engaging discussions there, and I had plenty of comments, but I will um, uh, stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Igor, for that. I really appreciate your, your comments. Uh, so our last uh, panelist uh, then today uh, for this session is uh, Peter Dixon. Uh, Peter is a research scientist in the Conflict Resolution and Coexistence Program uh, at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University where he's co-leading the Everyday Justice and Policy Innovation Projects, and his work intersects the fields of transitional justice, peace building, peacekeeping, um, and political violence. He's currently focused on the local reception of justice and peace processes in Colombia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the use of local indicators to guide justice and equity policies in the US. And he was one of the co-investigators on this project, leading the field work in Colombia. So uh, Peter, uh, hello out in cyberspace, and uh, I look forward to your, your words. Hello, James. Yeah, I'm here. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, perfect. Great. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, apologize. I can't be there in person with you all. Um, I also just wanted to say that uh, I consider it a, a privilege and an honor to share the stage with the panelists. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and um, just as as that last little bit of my, my bio suggested, I also just wanted to point out that um, you know, in the United States, the struggle for reparations is, is alive and is quite strong. Uh, and in fact, later on today, after this event, um, I'll be joining, a, there's a sort of a strategy call bringing together a variety of different civil society actors to um, strategize around issues of reparations for legacies of slavery uh, in the United States. Uh, so the US is, is by no means an exception uh, when it comes to these issues. Um, I was hoping to share a few slides, and it looks like I can. Great. Everyone see that okay? Um, fantastic. Okay. So um, we're, we're almost out of time here, so I'll, just, uh, I'll try to be brief. I just had three points I wanted to make. The first was to highlight the work of this project, 
bringing together uh, an extensive number of lessons learned around the role of civil society organizations and donors in reparations projects. Uh, the handbook is available on the project website. I don't know if hard copies have been distributed there today, but uh, but it's a, um, a very well designed and I think really thorough uh, summary of a number of very complex issues, uh, many of which we've, we've already heard about today. Uh, just wanted to pull out some of the key lessons. They're divided between engaging with civil society organizations and engaging with donors. Um, when it comes to civil society organizations, some of the key lessons include um, the uh, very core uh, value that work with victims should be based on consultation and co-ownership. Uh, and that relatedly victims need space to articulate what reparations should look like. And I think this is key that this is both pre award or pre-reparation process, as well as over time, because these processes can take a very long time, can last multiple and occur over multiple political administrations and contexts change and victims needs change and victims realities change. Uh, in many of these contexts, also the conflict is ongoing and violence is ongoing. So I think it's important to think of these as iterative processes rather than um, one time awards or decisions. Um, that civil society organizations really need to consider what is feasible, realistic, and, and I think in keeping with the, both the ethos and the uh, capacity of their organization. Um, and related to this, that reparations need to be viewed holistically and that not fulfilling promises can in some cases be worse than uh, actually promising less from the outset. I think the less something we've, we've heard from a few speakers here today. Um, and that finally, that work with victims needs to be informed by, by key uh, strategic values, um, uh, such as work that is ethical, non-discriminatory, um, uh, and informed by the principle of dignity. So very high level complex statements, but I'm gonna rush through them for the sake of, uh, of, of expediency. Um, in terms of lessons uh, that the group came up with for engaging uh, donors engagement in reparations processes, um, that donors should and need to support both victims groups and civil society organizations with measured expectations for both progress and delivery. Um, that support should be staged and should um, uh, take place over a long period of time, uh, as Igor was just saying, uh, because the conflict between a project-based approach to funding and the realities on the ground um, are great and wide, and it should be the realities on the ground that are driving funding decisions. Uh, that work with victims and civil society organizations should be carried out through principles of co-design. That reparations should be part of a broader strategy of conflict transformation that includes elements of development uh, and agendas for peace building. And I'll speak more to this in, this, in, the, in the next slide. Um, and that, and this is really important, uh, donors can by no means carry um, the torch of reparations by themselves, but should act within a broader context, uh, really of state responsibility. Uh, when we talk about civil society organizations and reparations processes, we inevitably touch on the relationship between transitional justice and related fields, namely development, which is an issue I'm, I've been particularly interested in in a number of different contexts. Um, and I just wanted to draw out a few key lessons that we learned in Colombia and really in elsewhere and in, in, I would say most of the other case studies that we looked at, especially those um, where there are conditions of, of uh, um, resource scarcity and, and poverty. Um, that civil society organizations have a wealth of experience and knowledge that comes from often work on development projects and in development contexts. And that experience and knowledge should not be, be feared or uh, diminished by donors, courts, states, et cetera, those coming from a justice-based orientation, but really should be embraced. Um, because that knowledge and experience is incredibly relevant. Um, that uh, at the same time, those driving reparations processes here, we can think about courts, we can think about ministries, we can think about donors, should really have a well-articulated and transparent strategy 
about how their work engages with both transitional justice and development. I think we've seen with a number of organizations, the International Criminal Court included, um, sometimes a tendency to try to ignore or minimize the relationship between a justice process like reparations and a development process like assistance. Um, but that is um, in practice uh, sort of a fool's errand, if you will, because it's, it's, it's essentially impossible because these, these fields are so inextric inextricably linked. Um, and, and finally, that reparations processes really need to work through a variety of different means to really understand from the perspective of those affected by violence, what their everyday understanding is of reparations. Uh, and here, I think there are very valuable lessons to be learned about what development and reparation mean to those, to, to, to people, to victims in affected communities um, who are experiencing and receiving these, these processes. Uh, my final point is, is a broader one. I come from the field of, of sociology, so I tend to look at these issues from a sociological perspective. And I think what we see is that um, civil, society, civil society organizations and donors uh, can be thought of kind of as, as players in a broader transitional justice field. Um, and related to my previous points, in this field, there are certain forms of knowledge and certain forms of practice that are, that are privileged over others. Sometimes courts will privilege uh, knowledge and experience um, tending more towards uh, criminal justice. Um, and as I said, minimizing experience that might come from working with victims, but from a development perspective. And I think that's uh, very much a mistake that that kind of knowledge and experience really should be embraced. Um, I think we've also seen, and this has come up from a few other speakers, that civil society organizations can, can sort of pivot based on where funding is available, where international organizations are uh, uh, putting emphasis, which forms of violence are deemed legitimate and significant. So uh, an organization that previously was a specialist in agricultural development can pivot and become a specialist in uh, victims rehabilitation through agricultural support, for example. And I bring that up not to say that it's a, um, a, a kind of a weakness or a cost to reparations processes, but again, that through transparent and strategic discussions, that kind of experience really should be embraced um, uh, so that reparations processes can be holistic, distinguished from development processes, but still drawing on the relevant forms of knowledge and expertise that come from that kind of development work. Uh, let me leave it there and hope we can uh, have some time for some Q&A. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Peter. And thanks to all of our panelists. That was an incredibly rich discussion. And uh, I think we had uh, a w range of both uh, lived experience and, uh, and particular experience, and then a, a big uh, macro discussion from our speakers. Um, on, online as well. Um, so we have some time for questions, so I'd like to gather a few uh, in the room or if there's any online as well uh, before we uh, proceed. So please. I can abuse my chair's privilege if needs be, but uh, I would love to hear from somebody else. Kim. Hi, uh, thanks to, to all the speakers. That was uh, a, a great range of uh, talks uh, that, that spoke to a lot of different elements. I guess my, my sort of question slash comment is, is for uh, Andre. Uh, I was particularly sort of taken by this idea that 99% of what goes on is, is out of the uh, public eye, and that sort of resonates with something my colleague Lauren Dempster talks about, quiet transitional justice, so all of this stuff that doesn't go on in the news headlines, doesn't necessarily go through formal uh, sort of TJ mechanisms, but goes on in the background between NGOs, individual victim survivors and that. And particularly also your, your uh, argument or point that you were making about that this isn't necessarily about challenging all of these conflict narratives, it's about rewriting a narrative that hasn't been correctly written in the past. And I totally agree with that. People talk about rewriting history. Well, maybe if history hasn't been written properly in the first place, we should re rewrite it, uh, particularly at the individual level. But in terms of sort of that idea of changing in uh, narratives at the individual level and also sort of merging that with this 99% of, of stuff that goes on out of the, uh, the sort of public gaze. Um, so the, the organization that you work with is, you know, I, I guess in the public mind, most associated with the victims of state violence, but they've also worked uh, internally 
with victims who have also been uh, you know, victimised through uh, the, the actions of Republicans as well, and on a number of cases been uh, uh, sort of trusted. Uh, confidant sort of interlocutors in, in terms of uh, getting redress for people who were like, wrongfully accused of, of being informers and shot dead. So maybe you could say a little bit about that uh, in terms of how that is changing conflict narratives without challenging anybody else's narratives, but changing an individual narrative that this individual was wrongfully targeted or wrongfully killed. So, uh, and is there perhaps a possibility to replicate that out? So, this isn't about rewriting master narratives, it's actually about looking at the individual case. Yeah, so there's a, this actually feeds a little bit to something I was talking about earlier on um, in, in a different room about sexual violence and sexual harms. So, sometimes harms get hidden within communities because people feel that if they were to ventilate it or draw attention to it, it would be used against the state or re re by reinforcing Republican narratives of the conflict or on the other way, um, reinforcing anti-Republican um, kind of voices. And people within communities can be really aware of that and that can hamper engagement in, uh, in all kinds of processes, under-reporting of sexual violence is one of them, but also within a community where we say, and the communities that I often work with, in Republican communities where Republicans have committed the harms. But the person wants to engage with the Republican movement, wants to, wants to rewrite, the, might have been a statement at the time that it was a justified killing for whatever reason, and they want the Republican movement to acknowledge that it was wrong. Um, and securing, um, Securing public statements that redress that, and some of them have been in the public domain, can take quite a long time. Often depends on the individuals that are approached and also the wider context. So, you know, I mean, other, other things will influence that. Following Boston tapes, it's much more difficult work than it was beforehand, I have to say, but it's not impossible by any stretch. We're still, we're still managing to get um, public statements. Um, that's absolutely outside of the official structures, how we think about we're going to deal with the past if we ever get there. For families whose relatives are very elderly, who need something now, um, these statements, as completely imperfect as the processes are, is completely lacking in transparency in many ways that these processes are. Um, at least they deliver something there that gives a basis for the big processes if and when they come, because they will come no matter how, how many people are trying to stop them happening. Um, and I think that's really important. What also is important in it is that we value the stories within the stories. So that was what was so important about us putting the gender lens in it. Women, 91% of those killed were men, so that has immediate gender implications. Women are often viewed in the debate on dealing with the past as either eyewitnesses in some cases or as next of kin to fill in a green form for the solicitors. Right. So what we needed to do was look at that. And even when we did that, we rewrote narratives, official narratives, because those women's um, experience of that same event can be very, very different to what's already in the public domain. So, you know, yeah, there's multiple processes for that, notwithstanding the big macro things that aren't happening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Yeah, my question's for Andrea again. Um, I'm just drawn on um, what Ruben was saying earlier on needs versus wants. Um, I mean, you were speaking there, I was just drawn to your were or the women report that you've done in rural versus urban um, differences. So I wondered if you could speak to this further and how um, a reparation program could draw on this gender lens, but as well apply these needs, this urban needs and these rural needs, and how should that look like? Um, I'm I think it's very like what the last speaker was talking about. So, so we centre it on the people that you're working with um, and where they are. So, and you build in processes of noticing. So, what's the? I mean, the urban versus rural needs wasn't because me, you know, a dog living in Belfast has an urban lens and everything, right? It, it's and so I was looking at cold cheese or something like that. That isn't what happened. It was that 
to be able to have women who are in different geographic areas engaging meaningful processes, we had to do different things. And when you do that from that sort of community development approach, then you start seeing the different needs and the different engagements. Now, ultimately, the big, big things that came out at the very end were very, very similar. They didn't, but in order to engage in the process, you had to do different things. And the process is just as important as the outcome. If it, in many ways it's more important because engagement um, and, the, and for it to be meaningful is all about process. And that's why you have to tailor it all the time to need. I think we've time for one more yet. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, from the audience online. Okay. Uh, the first is from Moise, and I think Peter and Igor, you, you can probably see these in the chat. But from Moise, uh, direct to Peter, is how is it decided which experiences and expertise are preferred over others, and who decides it? You know, is it NGOs or people um, or victims? And then Adrian has asked um, for Igor. You know, you started your input by reminding us that ultimately reparations are the duty of the state and ended on the challenges of time-bound NGOs, civil society organizations, and projects-based reparations. Can you explain further then on how we get hold of the state to account with regard to symbolic reparations, specifically memorialization, as often the state and victims and survivors aren't aware that this is part of transitional justice, even though it's evolving? So Peter, do you maybe want to go for that first? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll just speak quite briefly. Um, I mean, it's a great question. Um, I think uh, to Igor's point about kind of the project-based approach to reparations, where reparations processes are more in-kind than financial, you know, where it's um, um, rehabilitation or um, financial support of some uh, or sort of technical support, agricultural support, I think typically the focus tends to come, tends to be put on implementation and the expertise for how to implement the project, how to um, carry out the specific tasks and del deliverables that are part of a reparations project. And there, I think the determination of what kind of experience and expertise is valued tends to come from the donors, frankly, from those who are, for example, reviewing proposals or considering um, um, different candidates from a, a more sort of technical perspective. And I think often, um, there can be a kind of a capture process where um, other forms of experience and expertise um, are lost. But you know, that's not the only way it happens. I think there are great examples of where um, multiple forms of experience and expertise are valued. Those tend to be, I, I would say, processes that focus or depend more on consultation. Uh, I can think of a few from Colombia, for example, um, such as the uh, collective development projects that um, were uh, part of the, um, uh, the peace accord um, and others. So I think it's um, ultimately to summarize, it, it depends on how the reparation process is actually um, being implemented and where it's more project-based. I think it tends to be more donor, uh, donor driven. Okay. Uh, shall, I, shall I continue on the, on the next question? And, and also, I also, I want to use something that Peter just said, you know, in terms of the, to answering the questions, when the decision comes, you know, and who is making the decision, who gets engaged and what, and then continue to the next question. Uh, Peter mentioned very importantly the consultation process, you know. I think that, that's the point, you know, where different organizations who have a different relationship with the victims and can relay their voice, you know, they come forward and they say, and they express their interest and capacity. They say what the victims need and they, they tell us what they can do or what they want to do. Uh, so I think that's the moment when the decision happens. Also linked to the question that was posed to me directly, the, 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 which issues are being put on a, on, a, on, a, on a table in terms of what is expected in terms of reparations depends actually on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the NGOs who are closest to the victims. Uh, whether the victims, they choose the, the, the compensation, rehabilitation, uh, collective reparations, individual reparations, uh, 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 memorialization, or any other measure, that's completely up to the victims. And the NGOs would be the conduit of these wishes and desires and expectations of the victims, you know, what should get into the, into the reparation package. And then the NGOs being engaged on behalf of the victims, expressing their expectations about uh, uh, different type of 
reparations, including memorialization, would make sure in an ideal case scenario that this goes into the reparation policy and stays there. And it's implemented in accordance with what we have been uh, decided during the, the, the consultation process. This doesn't happen always. For example, the wishes in, of many NGOs uh, linked to the victims in Sri Lanka about the memorialization uh, uh, for the, su the suffering of the Tamil civilians, you know, they never got into the, into the process of reparation. I mean, the reparation process not, didn't even happen there because the whole transitional justice process were canceled because of the change of, of, of the government, et cetera. But um, uh, um, it is, you know, uh, that pathway, you know, that, that create, you know, that sort of, you know, influence, you know, what's going to happen and what's going to stay in terms of sustainability. It's victims to NGOs to, 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 to government. Uh, and I think NGOs knowing the options for reparations, including various types and modalities of reparations, such as memorialization, and communicating this with, with the victim in an interactive way, it's very, very important. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Igor, I just have time for, I think, one more from Mark here at the front, yeah. Conscious of time again, it's more a comment uh, and it can be verified. Uh, there, this session was titled The Role of Civil Society and Other Organisation in Supporting Reparations. Um, and we have said reparations takes many forms. Uh, the Bill of Rights Forum, that was part of the Promise of the Good Friday Agreement that our new society would be underpinned uh, by, by a Bill of Rights to ensure appropriate delivery for all on an equal basis. Uh, it was supposed to be reflective of civic society. Victims didn't form a part of our civic society. We had to fight to be allowed to be observers after making our submission to attend those sessions. So I think that's just a, a reflection on how we were dealing with things at a point in time. The other thing in terms of Paul's excellent presentation was we sought to bring civic society along by humanizing, but learning how to tell our stories in the appropriate time frame. So if it needed to be a short version of that story, it would be that. And we were never political or maybe Political was a small p, but we were a cross community group, and I think that enabled us to convey our messages in a fair way. Thanks very much. Thanks to all our speakers and to those who uh, asked questions and engaged from the, the floor. Uh, I think it was really rich and varied uh, discussion, and I think really demonstrates the, the, the range uh, of complexity and work that needs, uh, is done and needs to be done uh, regarding reparations uh, and, and civil society. So please uh, join me in thanking all our contributors. Thanks. <laughs>